this is the video on the class for next Wednesday. And I'm because there have been interruptions and all sorts of stuff. I'm going to start from the beginning to just explain to you the basic idea I had in mind. And your papers are just about what you think is the legacy of ancient Greek civilization in the era of globalization today, right, for you. So you don't have to understand everything. You don't have to read everything. I don't want you to panic. Um, I just want you to, to get a free imagination. Think about how the story about the Greeks could make you, could contribute to your own um, life as an artist. Because the Greeks really did value the arts. And so the assignment for today is about Hesiod. And he really, really thought the artists were the educators of humankind. But I'm going to start out with where we started. Um, the overall theme of this class is that the Greeks, there was this leap in consciousness from just cognition, people adapting to their environment without thinking about it. They're just doing it to all of a sudden they realize, oh, we are the species that recognizes patterns in a world where patterns exist. So then they were so motivated to find more patterns. What are the patterns in the movement of the stars? What are the patterns in natural events like lightning, thunder? They try to find natural causes for everything because that's part of this leap in consciousness, this higher level of self-conscious awareness. And then there's this slow, slow process whereby the artists, um, Hesiod, Homer, the tragedians, are trying to get us to map in our minds a microcosm of the macrocosm. So the way we feel, the way we think, the choices we make literally incarnate the truth. Like we're living the life of the mind based on pattern recognition in a world that's governed by a divine mind, this ultimate ordering principle, which is not a person or anything. It's just the very fact that we evolved. Why did we evolve? Why were we fit? Well, because we could recognize patterns and they're actually out there. That's why we've been so successful. So then to realize that, so each person each day we study somebody else that's contributing to this effort to be self-educating and a self-sustaining society and it went from a more authoritarian uh, form of government and to uh, less and less until the Athenians um, came up with this democracy which is um, included an assembly of citizens that were picked by lot to vote on all the major public decisions. And then the citizens were jurors in criminal trials. So this was considered highly advanced. Every other culture they knew of was much more authoritarian. The monarch had the last word or the aristocrats ran everything, the privileged class. Uh, boys were born into that privileged class and they knew they would have privilege just for that reason. Um, and that got replaced. But then Plato talks about how they corrupted their tradition and they lost it. And eventually they elected a dictator. So um, the other pieces in this are the pre-Socratics who studied the natural universe 
The Olympics is another one, the Oracle at Delphi. All these traditions that started about 800 BC, just there was syner their synergy, like they must have known what each other was doing and they must have learned from each other. So that's the way I tell the story is all these relevant things on the way while they're developing this and then how they got, how they corrupted it. So I think when I give these lectures abroad, I can give them to developed countries, Americans, and Americans will agree. Yeah, like we're going to lose our democracy because we have all these corrupt notions, corrupt goals. Or, and this is conservative as well as liberal. I mean, the political labels don't fit because Plato is saying it wasn't any one person or any one school or any one anything. It was all of them together. It was collectively, nobody was paying attention to the well being of the city. Everybody was just paying attention to their own power, glory, and wealth and pleasure. And pretty soon the city collapses. Like you can't have citizens voting when all they vote for is what will promote their own interests. Because then you just have a civil war, you just have faction between people. And eventually an authoritarian leader steps up and says, I'll bring us back to law and order in the good old days when people cared about family, patriotism, and traditional religion. And um, so, I mean, Plato lived through that, but he, he thought to himself, oh my gosh, this is gonna happen again and again. And so that's sort of where it culminates. But I can give this lecture in China or um, Prague. I can give it to students from Africa, all over the world, really. They get it and they use, they, they give examples from their own ruling class. I remember a girl from Tajikistan, I think it was, uh, one of those Istans there, and she talked about her president and he cheated on his wife just like Zeus and the wife blamed the women just like Hera and he also had a daughter who ran her own communications like tv show and was really into social justice so she was a daddy's girl and she defended him but promoted justice and wisdom except when she defended her dad. And that's classic Athena. So it is amazing how often these patterns just keep coming back. Um, so that's, let's look at what we've got here. Um, so let me look, let me just describe what we've covered so far, the material. Um, so, you can write. Um, you can write uh, about your. I think you haven't handed in anything yet. So, what do you think the legacy is? And you can base it on lectures that have happened since then. You just want to keep asking yourself: Is the lecture for today something that I think is meaningful to pass down? to the next generation, right? Is, it, is this one important to preserving democracy or not? So every day you can keep that in mind. That's the ultimate question, right? Um, all right, so the next one is Greek history and Greek wisdom. So I'll talk about that a little bit. And then we'll talk about um, the pre-Socratics. Um, and we'll talk about that article about psychology. And that's, you know, not an easy article and it's long. It's just that it shows that Aristotle's view is very consistent with contemporary views. Um, and then I talk about Jung and Plato, the collective unconscious. And um, you read about Crete, about the women. And I was talking about um, 
how telling those stories can be very inspiring for women artists. Just like remember Collingwood and Berger said, when everything is corrupt, they have to back off and figure out how they can get their inspiration. And I think for women reading these stories, these rewritten stories about what these women's lives would have been like with if it was a women-centered culture, yeah, it can be really inspiring. It can be way out of all the patriarchy and all the corruption. Um, and then I think that's as far as we go for now. And um, I'll, so I'll take it from there. All right. So the first day is Greek history, a quickie that the Homeric age, pre-Socratic philosophy, Olympia, Delphi, um, it, it went from Crete, when you see in Delphi, the culture of Crete, the priests from Crete came to Delphi, which is the, the um, site where the God of reason is worshiped. And so this was the transition from matriarchy to patriarchy or from women-centered culture to male-dominated culture. So I don't like to say matriarchy, patriarchy, because women-centered culture is not a domination culture. It's a cooperation. It's life-affirming and it's life-centered. The great goddess unfolds, right? all of her life and all of our the tools for us to live well and it's just totally different than a competitive adversarial you know using other people for power money um, status so anyway we had we have that origin okay. uh, all right so during the Homeric age, I'll talk about Greek mythology for a day, and then um, talk about how um, Homer used the stories of the gods to make his own points, and the Iliad and the Odyssey, what I think are the main lessons from that. Um, and then pre-Socratic philosophy, there's a natural foundation for reality. So I'll talk about that some more in a minute. Um, all right, the democracy. Why is it they have a democracy? Well, it's certainly not as inclusive as we have now, but I think we still tend to make the same mistakes, but you can decide for yourself. Um, and there are good arguments. It's just that I don't know of other people that can make the case as well, but there's, there will be, you know, artists like you, Ivy, can, can expand our consciousness and also um, take these old archetypes and on the one hand, change them to include racism, to be more focused on racism and sexism, because I'll show you that the tragedies themselves try to get men to rethink their sexism and their racism, uh, whether they learned that or not, that's a problem. So the purpose of legislation is to mold character so people think about the public good. There's six types of government and it's a government is just if the ruler is ruling for the benefit of the ruled. So it doesn't matter if it's a monarchy, an aristocracy, or a democracy. Um, democracy would be the rule constitutional government. It's a constitution of laws, and then everybody's equal under the laws. So in each case, if the monarch uses all of his advantage, to um, gain more power and privilege for his friends and family. That's a tyranny. If he actually uses his power and privilege to lift people up and create a middle class, and he's focusing on thriving and flourishing for everyone, 
that's a just government. The aristocracy is in theory, the uh, rule of the upper class that's actually earned that by showing that they use power for the well-being of the ruled, because some people are better at that than others. The trouble is when people who have those positions have children, they don't want their children to have less status. So it turns into an oligarchy. It turns into the rule of the rich uh, pretty easily. So in theory, you know, some people are better at governing than others. In practice, anybody who makes that claim ends up <laughs> using their money and power, um, just like Berger talks about. But the rule of the many, in a, good, in a just democracy, people are self-controlled and they're generous and they rule for the good of everyone. They're governable. They, um, they're willing to share their, you know, they have all these qualities of character. They want equal access to education and healthcare. They want everyone to flourish. But in, an un, in a corrupt democracy, everybody takes the freedom they have to just be impulsive or greedy or aim for power. Um, and they use manipulative language to get there. Berger would say that the art historians, that whole bunch of professionals are using manipulative language to delude themselves about how superior they are and all that. Okay, the best form of government for Aristotle is a polity. So it's a mix of aristocracy and democracy. So people with talent for ruling are given more opportunities. So some positions are appointed and some positions are elected. We have that in our society. And right now, the ones that I think of are the cabinet. Uh, the Department of Housing and Human Services, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Labor, the Department, the Judiciary. And my daughter worked in one of those for 15 years and her husband still does. They're huge, you know, but everybody in them could have a job making more money, but they want to promote a middle class and avoid uh, oligarchy, the rule of the rich, and that'll just lead to, that'll shrink the middle class. So they're all working toward a middle class. Um, but when Donald Trump um, appoints people to the cabinet, he appoints people who have been sued by that branch, that department before. <laughs> so raw Pre previous, previous, there was a guy from Oklahoma whose campaign money comes from oil and gas, and he, he had been sued by the Environmental Protection Agency for um, violating environmental laws, and his buddies had gotten sued. And so Trump made him the head of it. So he told them, you know, we're not going to do it this way. We're going to do it that way. And you can't report in things and you're going to cut these rules. It was pretty crazy. And the same thing with education, Department of Education, is to try to have some kind of standardized way to educate every citizen, even the poorest. Well, sh who should run that? Should it be someone who is a minority and who went through the public schools and who managed to do well, they would know through experience what, you know, have, and they would have friends that also would know when they would consult with people who have some empathy for the underclass. But Trump appointed a woman who was super rich, a billionaire. Five of Trump's appointees were billionaires. And she had not never set foot in a public school. She went through her education, not only in a private school, but in a reformed church, which is very repressive, very strict, very stringent. 
So here she is a billionaire whose only knowledge of education is strict, absolute. She can help us reform our public system. Yeah, anyway, the main point here is that the best form of government involves some appointed positions and some elected positions. But if the people with power are in it just to get more power and money, they will appoint the people who will pander to that and set out rules and change the rules or the guidelines or not enforce them. There's a lot of ways you can get around this. Okay, and, and I don't think an Americans really know enough about that. That's my opinion. If you knew who Clinton and uh, Bush and um, Obama and uh, Trump and uh, Biden, who they appoint for their cabinet. It's very revealing. Um, okay, so rulers, you have, citizens need to be trained to be able to function in their form of government. So in America, we really should educate high school students to really think like a citizen. And I don't think that's what's happening. <laughs> uh, the importance of habit and custom, especially the habit of abiding by the laws. So don't change the laws too open, too often. The liberal values are generosity and temperance because people have to be self-controlled in order to maintain stability. And then they also have to be generous. They have to realize they depend on other people and either provide through taxes, public education, public health care, or through donations. But they're not just in it for themselves. They don't just take the system and try to milk what they can for themselves. Um, the political evil is greed. And this is, Americans just don't believe this. They think greed is a political good, but I, I really don't think so. And I don't think history has proven that. So what happened was, um, so there was 800 BC, this gradual development Homer, Hesiod Homer, and then um, Athens. So the tragedies are from playwrights that were in Athens and performed at the contests in Athens. So what happened was the Greeks defeated the Persians and this was a great victory. The Persians are actually the Iranians. <laughs> so some things never change. Um, the Greeks were outnumbered. They took advantage of their geography and they won. And so this was a huge flourishing, right? The gods are on our side. And so then they had a golden age and they had Pericles and the Olympics and all this stuff. So I'll talk about that. But they also started to go to war against the Spartans because the two most powerful city-states during the war against the Persians, two city-states sort of emerged and that was Athens and Sparta. And so Sparta was the closed society. They were, everything was about military achievement. That was what the society valued. So if you were a young soldier and you acted bravely, then you got to be a general. And if you were good at that, you would be probably elected to political office, which until recently, many of America's presidents had been former military. Um, anyway, so, so they, the Spartans, everything was um, dedicated to victory in war. And they thought the Athenians were degenerate and um, self-indulgent and perverted. And you know, they weren't disciplined. And then the Athenians thought that no, war is for the sake of peace. So you can have scientific exploration, free scientific investigation, free artistic expression free, you can vote, you know, in the assembly and you, and you have these opportunities to debate on public affairs and the city wants you to debate on public affairs. And it gives you this opportunity at the marketplace 
And everybody's on board for constantly debating how we should live, what sorts of decisions we should make. Um, so they thought they were more evolved than the Spartans because all they cared about was victory and war. Okay, so that didn't go well. I mean, that lasted a long time. And eventually, Athens lost, and they shouldn't have lost because they were the stronger city-state, but they thought they could do anything. So they sent ships in three different directions and just were completely, um, they, they, you know, they wasted a lot of troops and money and ships trying to just wipe everybody else out. They formed two leagues of city-states. So the other city-states would have said, just leave us alone. You guys just kill each other off. But of course they didn't. They developed these power blocks. So every city-state had to be for you or against you. They, you know, and if a city state didn't kiss up to Athens, they would treat them really <laughs> wickedly. And they also taxed them to build their monuments like the Parthenon and all their wonderful structures that was built on taxing their allies and, and spending the spoils of war. And so when you spend the spoils of war, it really corrupts your motive like, why are you really fighting to protect a just cause or to get rich? Um, and then when you treat your allies that way, you're not giving those people a chance to have enough money and, so that the people can have leisure time and they can start governing themselves. So Athens claimed to be saving the world for democracy, but they actually were building an empire. And they were even comparing using analogies between they were doing and the Persians. <laughs> Although I don't think they announced that. <laughs> like they're behaving like the Persians, the very people they hate. Anyway, eventually Athens lost and they elected Critias, one of Plato's uncles, who said, if, if you elect me, I'll bring us back to the good old days when kids listen to their parents and um, People were loyal to Athens, blind patriotism, and they're willing to defend it at all costs. And they believe in the traditional God. So that lasted for less than a year. And then the democracy was restored. And then Socrates was killed. So, um, so we'll talk about that some more. And there's analogies, right? Do you see analogies between this? and American history. And then I have some stuff about Socrates and Socrates and Jesus, Plato, but you don't have to look at that. It's just, we might look at it later on at the end of the semester. Um, okay, so this is a book by a classicist that he's trying to make it more accessible so that it's not so, so much scholarship. He said, what the Greeks teach us, right? Um, what you can learn is humanism, the pursuit of excellence, moderation, self-knowledge, rationalism, restless curiosity, the love of freedom, individualism, and um, obstacles and all that. I don't necessarily agree with every point, but I did give you an assignment and you can think about that. Uh, which one of those, ones of those you agree with. Uh, this is the lecture on the pre-Socratics, um, the overall project. And we went over this in class. The different schools of thought had different views about the ultimate principles of the universe. Um, then this one is this one is about trying to wire yourself, your mind. Um, so what's most immediate to us is least important overall. So for example, when you run into a, a situation that has race, racism against African-Americans, you know that oh, this has a huge history. 
and that's why when I see, like when I talk about burger, I just see things differently. So I know about the housing situation for African-Americans. They've never been able to get decent housing that goes up in value so that their family can have wealth. It builds equity. It's just incredible. And so then they don't have wealth. They can't pass down from parents to children the way white people can. But anyway, there's many, many things so that when you see some confrontation like Black Lives Matter and all that, uh, it's important to step back and think about well, what's the history behind this and how long a history is this. And oh my gosh. So then you need to know all that before you can think about well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do today? Um, there are basic forces in the universe that don't change. And then there's all these other things that do change when we adjust to our immediate situation. We can know our place in the universe. Um, some things are necessary, like gravity, electrical magnetism. Some things are contingent. They might or might not happen. And that's most of that is the realm of human affairs where we have choice. And we make choices based on our ideas of good and evil. Um, and some things are accidental, like it just happened. There wasn't anything systematic about an event. And then some things are impossible. So there's plenty of things that human beings might wish for, but they're not possible. And it's just a waste of your mind and your emotions to try and um, fantasize. That's the difference between a visionary and fantasy. Pattern recognition is a big deal. In the universe, the ecosphere, the biosphere, human nature, human history, human affairs, personal, family, society, and politics. Um, what is truth? There's People can create their own system. I'm going to define truth this way, and I'm going to create this internally consistent system. <laughs> but whether it has anything to do and, and there got to be a time when it didn't matter if it corresponded to anything. But the Greek view is, is really correspondence. There is an ordered universe out there, and there is an ecosphere out there. And we should live our lives in tune with that. Um, all right. So in the Enlightenment, uh, we decided the psyche was a blank slate or dualism. And... Whitehead says we're, we shouldn't have done that. We shouldn't have eliminated that. And Laszlo says also that what we need is the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And he talks about evolutionary consciousness, how consciousness has evolved. Um, then uh, Paul Davies is a quantum physicist. And he talks about the mind is an abstract concept, but that doesn't mean it isn't real. Wednesdays are an asset concept, but they're real because we live and breathe. We create a reality based on that concept. Um, so we thoughts cause thoughts and we create a whole um, view of reality based on our language and our concepts. Um, Aristotle had the correspondence theory, and then I talk about that, how he starts with what's basic and moves toward more and more complexity. And that's just, you don't have to, again, take in a whole lot of that. You just, we, you have, we've studied Aristotle's virtues before. You have to see that, that actually, if you exercise all these virtues, that you are trying to make yourself a microcosm in the macrocosm, um, trying to get your desires, your thoughts, your actions in tune with the truth. Um, and the most important truth is that human beings are more alike than different. And there is a human condition and we need to be attuned to it or we're gonna lose everything. Um, so you have the personal virtues, 
and then you have the political virtues, and then you have the other capabilities. So I will refer to these when we analyze the tragedies and Homer, uh, because the poets are very aware of that. Then the last time, I think we talked about Spretnik and the lost goddesses, and you talked about um, the, the stories, how different they are. And then um, this one about the poetry. And then this one, again, I'll try to find a review. I'll try to replace this. Um, uh, yeah, I have a zillion versions of this, but I will try to replace it. Uh, I hope I hope uh, I can do that and make it easier for you. So then, um, for Wednesday, let's see. All right, so last Wednesday, and then we have the following Wednesday. So uh, Jung and Plato from pages. One, um, okay, so pages five through 13, the, the centrality of self-knowledge, again, you could, this goes back to Collingwood, the artist knows himself and tries to get other people to know themselves, to get a heightened level of conscious awareness. Um, and he talks about Delphi. So, this is about the collective unconscious. So what he's claiming is that human beings evolved as a kind of animal. And so the animal part of our psyche, close to the brainstem, gradually evolved in the energy. We transformed it from just going after prey or, or um, running away from predators till we started thinking and we started planning and we started, um, you know, becoming in that sense rational. But we also have, when children are born, uh, they need, they're very vulnerable. And so there's patterns in how women and men relate to each other based on the fact that if we wanna flourish, we have to have children, raise our children. We have to participate in social life. We have to participate in political life. So if we wanna be flourishing, we have to do all those things. And so the Olympian gods, the stories of the Greek gods are about these patterns in the way the collective unconscious has evolved. And, um, and your personality um, is bigger than just your ego, right? It, it comes from all your development before that. Um, okay. It's, okay. All right. Let's see. Why does Plato choose the dialogue? Because thinking is an inner dialogue of the soul with itself. Oh, dear. <laughs> Okay, so if the page doesn't load, I will again try to repost it. Um, then, I'll do this outline, that'll work. So Jung's position, we can just go through the outline, is that there are these cultural roots, the unconscious, and we have symbolic images. So um, you can think about which, who, what people have been in, an inspiration to you, artists or political leaders or uh, teachers or somebody where you put the picture on a wall and you associate it with, and it's inspiring to you. And those are these uh, images that you project your own hopes and fears onto that. And you get to come to know yourself 
by looking at, well, what is it that you really, you know, resonate with? Um, okay, the inherited roots, we have these archetypes. And I'll talk about the Olympic deities, and you can decide. Well, remember with Spretnik, the, the women, the archetype before patriarchy was so different. And then patriarchy hit. And it just turned into this century after century of repeating patriarchy. And it's just harmful. Women are always getting harmed. But what you what the point here of objective psyche and subjective is like you might think you don't compete against women for men. It's like, I'm not going to do that, right? And then you find yourself in a situation where you're pitted that way, where your partner is like setting you up for that because it's this collective unconscious. It keeps repeating. Or the image of the temptress, right? Eve, you say, no, I don't believe in that at all. But then you get in a situation where you realize either you or the people around you are very heavily influenced by this and they're not conscious of it. And they deny that that's their real motive. And there's all sorts of stuff where the collective unconscious is driving people in ways that they aren't aware of. And they, because of that, they don't make any efforts to change. Um, meaning and purpose. We don't just want to eat, sleep, have sex and reproduce. We have a drive for meaning and purpose. Um, and if we stagnate, if we can't keep moving forward, it's a problem. Um, we suffer. So that's why I want you to think of this class. You have to keep envisioning, you know, what can I gain from this class? So you can overcome these obstacles of, um, you know, the logistics. So I hope you don't worry too much about logistics. And I'll try to um, talk about, here's where we're going. Here's what you have to keep in mind. Did anything I say, you know, resonate with you? So we need to form a relationship, a new form of relationship to the unconscious. And so Plato did that, but I think Charlene Spretnik did that with the Crete, the goddesses of Crete. And um, all right, so the two major tasks are we have aggression. And obviously, we have these, these young men with their AK-47s, obviously, we're capable of violence, very primitive violence, the January 6th insurrection. We're capable of this stuff. And so um, one big task of culture is to get young people, get young people to set a, a sense of meaning and purpose so they can channel their drives and tame you know, the aggression avoid violence and just pour their energies into something positive, something that this is the kind of person I want to be, or this is the kind of work I want to do, and I'm going to ignore everything else, and I'm going to go to bed tired because I tried so hard. Um, then the next part is um, animus and anima. So this is how male and female, everybody has the animus side, which is aggression, Everyone has the anima, which is the nurturing side. And we have to balance those out. And obviously in relationships between men and women, it breaks down a lot. And then couples in a patriarchy will tend to fall back onto some of these old <laughs> patterns, which are patriarchal and it's very harmful. So the complexes are what happens when you only focus on one thing and you get obsessed. And some of those complexes are of inferiority complex, 
a power complex, father, your relation to your father, your mother, anxiety. Um, you just become obsessed and you can't function very well. Okay, um, there's the universal versus the particular. So each person has that buried in their collective unconscious, but for each person, what would trigger it, trigger a complex would be different. Um, when a subjective psyche is identified with the complex, um, they really think they're powerful and they're really doing what's important and they're actually doing a lot of damage because they don't respect other people or other senses of calling. Um, they get isolated, they project. If, there's, if they think they're gonna save the world by making a lot of money and they start failing, well, then they're gonna blame somebody. It's, I was trying to save the world. I was trying to be successful and, and it hasn't worked and I'm gonna find someone to blame. Um, okay, so young people need to project some idea of the good out there. They need a, a elders who will help them figure out their sense of calling. Um, and how do you transform complexes into a balanced way of life and a fruitful way of life? Um, the goal is integrity, so that your emotions, your actions, your thoughts, your way of life are all integrated and you are flourishing and everybody around you is flourishing. You need an analyst. Young people need mentors. Um, it varies by age, you know, what they need. But uh, Jung and Plato both talked about the analyst as a midwife, and Socrates was a midwife. So he asked, well, what do you think? And then he tried to draw out from students or adults, um, whoever he was talking to, um, trying to help them understand what they really think, what's really going on inside them which is a lot like what Collingwood said, an artist will expose false consciousness, but the art of teaching or the art of being a midwife is also a kind of art which helps people become more conscious of their own psyche, their motivations and their, um, their character. Okay. And then you integrate what we think, feel, sense, and together our intuition. And so this is the arts are very important for integrating, assimilating the shadow and balancing animus and anima. Um, we have these images of the cosmic person, the philosopher's stones, you know, just steady and the midpoint of a personality. So any one person, has to have like a stone in the back that I will, I will always try to act on the basis of my idea of the good. And um, then each, each moment you have different situations that you deal with. Um, why should we compare them? Well, Plato's aim is individuation. Um, Socrates has all these qualities that Jung talks about and um, the other people he talks to have these problems. They have complexes. And, all right, so uh, Plato's categories and modern science. So um, I think that, I don't think I made you read all this stuff, um, but it does link it all together. Um, the Olympian gods, we'll start with that. And then uh, Plato eventually ends up with the character of Socrates. Um, that we have the same issues today, so I want you to make analogies. The irony of religious institutions, uh, religious leaders project the, the shadow onto other people. So this is what you're not supposed to do. 
you're not supposed to take all that aggression inside of you and repress it and deny it and go to church and pretend to be super holy. And then, oh, but it's these other people that are the bad guys that are causing all the evil in the world. This is a disintegrated consciousness. Um, okay. Applying Jung's categories to Hesiod, um, they can be read as stories of com complexes. And I will you know, explain that while I'm talking about that, when you read through that. They just get obsessed with something and they don't pay attention to what else is going on. Um, the religious tradition is unclear. So he said, tried, or the theogony is an effort to try and systematize all these gods because the Greeks is like, oh, this God made me do it. Or this God's mad at that God and that people couldn't get any underlying system. But he said, did try to get that. Um, systematize it in, into a creation story. What about women? Like, where do they come in? Um, and I think, I think what you see is that at Delphi, the female-centered, nurturing-centered culture that was linked to nature gets replaced by the worship of reason, a linear history. But the artists are supposed to, their duty is to constantly remind people, mostly men at this point, of all the ways they can go wrong, of all the excesses they can, um, all the corruption. And they'll have reasons. They always have reasons. They have reasoning, but, they, but they're not wise. Like, they get it wrong. Um, Plato overthrew his intellectual fathers. Um, all right, and that's later on when we get to Plato. But, and liberal arts education. So, so again, we'll go back over this later, those later pages. But, um, so we wanted to do the Olympian deities. So here's the, the original work, seven pages, it, it had this impact that the Adam and Eve story has. Um, then there's CC lectures, if you want to look at that. Um, that I can talk about Zeus's various affairs and Athena's various affairs and all of that. But let's look at the deities now. Um, the Olympic deities. All right. So each of them represent some level, something that we should be consciously aware of at all times if we're going to achieve wisdom the microcosm and the macrocosm. So Poseidon is the god of the sea. And if you annoy him, <laughs> he's going to blow winds and blow your ships, crash your ships. And if you, um, if you overstep the bounds, he will cause earthquakes, he will cause hurricanes. He will <laughs> and of course, that's what we're doing. We're overstepping our bounds and now we're having this huge climate disruption that you know a greek would say that's poseidon <laughs> and then demeter is the goddess of fertility of the land and human fertility and a greek would say well yeah the sperm count in men's semen is down 40 <laughs> percent like this is what we're doing with all of our technology we're destroying ourselves we're um destroying the earth so it's not fertile we have floods and deserts and it can't produce food for us um, then the food we do produce produce isn't really food it's it's uh, processed stuff 
that we get addicted to. So that undermines her gift of fresh um, crops, right? Vegetables, fruits, uh, wheat, you know, that's Demeter's gift and we're violating her. Then we have justice, um, Athena and Zeus. So these are the ones that, these are the people in society that her, their goal is to not just be a political leader, but they might want to be a judge. They might want to be a prosecuting attorney, a defense attorney, a lawyer. Um, but they also might want to just start their own institution. They want to start an organization that promotes human rights or social justice. So that's that would be what Athena and Zeus represent. Honor is uh, Hera and Ares. So over and above what people have to do to keep their jobs, um, many, many people, especially on the Lion campus, just go over and above that. And they there's an honor day. So I remember Jennifer, um, Heidi, that she, in addition to her position at the counseling center, she started a um, a free store for kids, students who wanted to dump stuff off when they're leaving, and other students who could pick that up and, and have winter coats or whatever they needed. Um, so she started the free store. She started this recycling program. Uh, so she was honored, right? That was honorable because it promoted the well being of the community apart from any laws or institutional requirements. And then Ares is also the god of honor. And he was the god of war because at that time they had a lot of wars. But nowadays I'd say that we honor rich folk because they've won the economic competition. Economic war is the new kind of war. Uh, a combination of cyber war you know, so we would honor somebody who prevents a cyber attack from the Russians, um, or we would honor, and then we tend to honor people who get rich without looking at how did they get rich? And why does our system allow that, right? But we tend to value that, and that's a mistake. Um, because the economic system, if it's based on winners and losers, that money is going to stick to money. There'll be very few, very rich people, and everybody else is just going to be struggling. And that's not a democracy. And then um, Apollo is the god of reason. So we do have these capacities for math, science, logic, argumentation, speech writing. And this is um, a lot of what you do in college or in school, are the intellectual virtues. But Apollo is emotionally immature and he doesn't care about justice. So he chases nymphs. So these would be um, really smart kind of STEM boys who really uh, sexually pursue women who are clear sex objects. Like that's all they care about is that they're um, they're objects of lust, and it doesn't occur to them that there's anything wrong with treating women like that. And then the other thing Apollo does is he brags about what a good CEO he is or whatever, and he provides jobs and his companies flourish, and he doesn't really care if he's selling products that people shouldn't be buying, <laughs> like... Um, well, biological weapons would be one of them, but um, it can be all sorts of fake food that people are getting addicted by or pharmaceutical, the opioid industry, which they just overlooked the fact that it was highly addictive. So those people who ran it were, um, you know, very Apollonian the scientists. They can create all this sophisticated stuff but they don't think about how to distribute it in society, how to prevent it from becoming a huge social problem. 
So that's Apollo. And then Artemis is the wilderness. So Apollo, Apollonian reasoning builds cities. You have to, you know, be an engineer to build buildings and roads and all that. So engineering, whereas Artemis wants people to pay attention to the wilderness and leave, leave it alone. <laughs> so they're twins and they're on opposite. They have opposite interests. Um, then there's the reflective ones, people who, who live and then reflect on their lives or who look around and reflect on what they see and try to find the patterns. So Hestia does that. And then Hermes, I don't have Hermes. Hermes, so Hestia tends the flame at home. And then Hermes takes that torch and goes out into the public. So uh, again, women until recently were, you know, women's places in the home and men's place. But now, you know, it can be the other way around. It's just that still you need to tend the flame at home and then carry it forward. Um, sensuality is beauty, the goddess of beauty. Now, it's not supposed to be the object of male lust. It's supposed to be a muse. So, um, Ivy, if you're an artist, you would like someone to be your muse, someone who inspires you and encourages you and keeps you going. Um, someone who's a vision carrier, who you can talk about your vision and they'll support it. And usually women have been that for men. Men will say, oh, she was my muse, she inspired me. But when do women get to get that from men, right? How many women say, oh, my husband was my muse and he just inspired me to, to. Or, or women can inspire other women. It doesn't have to be sexual at all. It's just being someone's vision carrier moving forward. Um, Dionysus is the god of wine and the god of the theater. And he's the only one who dies and is reborn. So the reason for that is the theater is where you go and you watch people living out some really dark, irrational emotions. And you go, ah, <laughs> okay, I don't think I want to do that. And so you purge that so that you have more energy to be creative. So you're not frustrated all the time. You're not repressed all the time. You've gone through the, the experience of for example, you want to take revenge, but then you think of uh, Clytemestra and you think, no, that, that didn't go well. <laughs> and so you get over it, but you have these archetypes in your head about what happens if you really yeah, actually act on some of your fantasies, your revenge fantasies, and it, it doesn't help. And so then... You want to get rid of your revenge fantasy so you can think about well, what's creative. What can I do to create something? Um, so that's why Dionysus is the god of the theater and he dies and he's reborn. And then the underworld is the place where you have to think about what sort of legacy am I going to leave behind? How am I going to be remembered? And um, so Hades reminds you of that. And Persephone was the one who was raped and abducted. And that's the hellfire brimstone. Like if you sought money or power, you used other people as your tools. So you, you committed sin, right? You, that kind of abuse, you made victims. You made people into victims to serve your plans. And so she, she will punish you right? She's been victimized and she will victimize you forever. So this is what we have. And I just have pictures of them, but um, we'll go over that class. And you can think about that. You can think about um, if you have some examples of, yeah. Okay. You could read Greek mythology and the human condition. You can read um, the 
read over this? See if it makes sense, but otherwise I'll talk to you about it. Um, and then he sees the agony. But the overall idea is to get that mythology is a kind of education for the primitive part of the brain because it's telling these stories about people who have given in to that and they're acting on the basis of it. It's showing you that that leads to disaster and it's trying to get you to, to disconnect those, um, to rewire those passions into something productive. So that's, that's the main thing there. Um, and then we do some more if you see it. Oh, okay. So you can read this chapter about he see. Let's see. This one is due for Wednesday. So, and then I have a summary of everything we've done so far. Um, It's kind of a cheat sheet. It's just 13 pages. And I think if you want to start out with um, with these two, um, he's, especially this one, it might help you figure out, you know, what you were supposed to get out of the earlier ones. But the theogony, he see it, the poetic tradition talks about the origin of things. And there were four forces chaos, Gaia, earth, eros, and thanatos. So out of the chaos, there's this drama played out on the earth, Gaia, between the destructive principle and the creative principle. And so these uh, myths are trying to transform the destructive, like, flush that out and so you can be creative so you can actually help other people you can flourish you can help other people flourish um so that's the creation story and then the gaia comes first right life life is prior to everything else so women first then she gives birth to sky uranus and then they have a lot of other children and the and the there are earthquakes and there are mountains are forming and water bodies are forming so the earth is changing the surface of the earth so one of the deities one of the uh, one of their offspring is chronos time because now the earth has a history it has a natural history chronos and they also gave birth to monsters which had like three heads and five arms and whatever. And Uranus was embarrassed by them and threatened by them. So what is this about? And I think, I think the poets are warning men who get their egos caught up in their children and they don't let the children figure out for themselves what they want to do. So, um, the men, okay, so what happens if a kid is born and he or she is not as smart as their dad and not as good looking and not as athletic? All the things he gets his ego caught up in and he wants his son, son or daughter even to be a chip off the old block, right? Yeah, it makes him look good, um, but the kid isn't, like they don't they're not athletic and they're not good looking and they're not that smart. Is that the kid's fault? No. <laughs> so that's the, that cripples the kid psychologically. So that's one thing wrong about Uranus. Then the other thing, he was threatened by them. He thought they might overpower him. So what happens if one of these ego-driven fathers, um, has kids that are smarter than him and they have opportunities that he didn't have 
and um, they're better looking and more athletic. Um, and that there was a movie, Fences, I think, about this. It's really awful. Um, this African American guy has a son and he gets a scholarship to go to college, and the dad just doesn't want him to take it because he got to work like everybody else or something. It was just really awful. But this is, you know, that's what that story is about is that the father competes against his kid. Now, is that a good thing to do? Oh, the kid is just trying to develop his or her own potential. So Uranus, um, so Gaia, he buries the monsters in Gaia, right? So the mother comes and tries to protect them from this aggression and the psychological brokenness of the of the dad and she's not happy about it right you're wrecking you know you're you're manipulating the kids you're harming them psychologically so he meets all the kids together and she has a sickle and she says i want one of you to cut off your father's genitals and what that means is you cut off their eros eros is our drive for creativity for flourishing and so Kronos raises his hand. <laughs> Why? And so he cuts off his father's genitals and becomes king of the gods. Well, makes sense because the earth has a natural history. And so after the history develops, you have to have Kronos. You have to have a timeline of what the earth was like before and after a certain event. So Kronos becomes the next king of the gods. Um, and then when he starts having kids, he gets paranoid <laughs> that one of his kids is going to do that to him. So he eats them. <laughs> okay. And so psychologically, you can talk about uh, dads or parents that devour their children, like they don't give them a chance to just flourish. And um, so then um the the woman involves right ray chronos's partner is really annoyed by this and so she gives birth to zeus but she goes to her in-laws she goes back to gaia and uranus and say hey guys uh i want to get i want to have a kid that will overthrow chronos and I want you to, you know, to help me hide him away. And yeah, and Uranus was all in favor of this. Like after what he did to me, sure, I want him to have a kid that goes and cuts off your genitals too. So he hides him and he is raised in Crete. Okay, back to Crete in a cave in Crete. And she gives him a stone to instead. And so eventually Zeus becomes the king of the gods. And then you start in with human relationships or how the gods relate to each other. So the first is earth and sky and the second. And then the other deities that are born in that generation are Hestia, Hera, Poseidon, Demeter. Those are all those natural forces. And reflection is natural. I think that's pretty interesting. Um, and then the second generation is um, uh, Kronos' kids are, um, let's see, I think, anyway, he, he eats his kids and then his partner gives him a herbal remedy that makes him throw up. So he throws them all back. And so, um, so those come back. Then in the third generation, Zeus is king, is the god of justice. So you can see earth and sky, time, justice. And now you have these deities who are relating to each other in these very archetypal ways. And so now you have the deities from the first generation, the second generation, third generation. And um, Zeus has affairs and these kids are born. So Zeus has an affair with Semele, 
and Dionysus is born. Zeus has an affair with Leto and uh, Apollo and um, Artemis are born. And um, I can explain more of that because the lecture is getting awful long. So I'll explain more of that and you can read some of that and we'll talk about that next time. But I think the section on Hesiod will um, explain that. Um, um, how the muses educate. So the nine muses are how we educate ourselves and each other through music and dance. Um, all those, it's amazing. They're all, they all represent an, a kind of pattern recognition. Um, So why don't you just read, just read these two and you can, unless you want to go further and read the previous ones, but I think these sort of summarize what we've been doing. Um, and then you can write down, you know, questions you have, or how do you see how this fits together? What do you see? I mean, you can feel like, well, I'm overwhelmed, but you can always pick out something. So pick out those things that resonate with you, especially if you read the Hesiod and you start hearing the stories of the gods. There should be things that resonate with you that you can identify with. And that's where we'll start. Um, I think we aren't going to actually meet in class until uh, a week from Friday. So good luck. And you can email me anytime and I can... I can help you with the stuff as soon as I get there. So I'll get there really close to the time we would normally meet on Wednesday. And um, anyway, I will contact you and Liam and my other student when I get there and when I get online. And whenever you have time between, yeah, I would just say if I need help, just say, I need help, and these are the hours. So, uh, seven in the morning, seven, I think you have a 10 o'clock class. So, those hours that we normally have class, or 10 to 11, and then even if you want to meet 11 to 12, this would be 11 to midnight for me, but I don't mind, Ivy, because I worry, you know, I'm sorry that um, there's a lot of adjusting to do. I just would like you to have a free imagination. Think about those muses. Just think about them on your own. What is it about dance or poetry or painting or these that tries to educate human beings for self-conscious? And this, again, is not is a lot like what Collingwood says, you know, exposing false consciousness. The myths expose all the evils, right? The emotional evils justified in the name of whatever. The people who do horrible things have lots of reasons and they kind of look like good reasons, but they're not. In the end, it's a disaster. So, um, so okay, I'm gonna leave it at that for now. But just let me know as soon as you um, as soon as you feel lost, and I will I will.